Hey. Hey. Thank you. It's, it's so great. It's, it's so great to be here with you guys at University of Luis. Thank you for hosting me this, uh, this afternoon. Um, now, Hey. Hey. Thank you. It's it's so great. It's it's so great to be here with you guys at University of Luis. Thank you for hosting me this uh, this afternoon. Um, now, before we get started, I want to say a few words about the earthquake. You know, our, our hearts go out to all of the people who have lost a home or have lost a loved one um, or you know, know someone who was affected by the earthquake. It's really hard to imagine, I think, what it's like to just in, in an instant uh, have your, your whole life turned upside down like that. And, you know, in moments like this, it's it's heartbreaking, but also seeing how the community here in Italy and around the world have been able to come together to rally for the people who have been affected by the disaster and those who love them. Um, seeing people come together and connect is, I always find really inspiring. And the spirit of the people here in Italy that we're going to get through this, and we're going to rebuild, and it's going to take a while, but you're going to make it happen, uh, I think is really inspiring to people all around the world. Now, I, I know that this is going to be a topic that we want to talk about a bunch today, and there are going to be a number of questions about this. I, I looked at the thread. I think the top voted question was about this. So we're going to get to that in a second. Uh, but I just wanted to lead with that up front and share that I, I feel uh, what, we're, what we're going through here. Now. Now, being here, being in this part of the world also brings out other emotions for me because I love Rome. <laughs> I love Rome. Um, um, I, studied, uh, I, I studied Latin and uh, Roman history and culture, and I, I loved it so much that when I thought, when I was going to college, I actually thought I was going to major in classics. I, I didn't. I ended up majoring in computer science and psychology, but I didn't make it that long in college anyway, so, um, so you know, that doesn't, not, not a big thing. Um, but I, but I, love, I love Rome. I love Rome so much that when my wife and I got married, we came here on our honeymoon. And I, I made us go to all of these different historical and classical places, so much so that when we got back and we were looking through the photos, uh, my wife was making fun of me that she thought that there were three people on the honeymoon, uh, me, her, and Augustus. <laughs> As we looked back, all the photos had uh, were just different sculptures of Augustus around the, the city, you know, the Prima Porta, the, um, the Augustus's home, uh, the Arapacus, all, all, all the favorites. Got to go to the hits if you're going to be here in Rome. So, um, so I, I love Rome. I love the culture here. It's great to be here with all of you today. I'm really happy to have the opportunity to share a part of Facebook's culture with you, which is these town hall Q&As. Now, every week, every Friday afternoon for probably about 10 years now, We've been doing an open Q&A where anyone at the company can come and ask me any question they want about what we're doing. And you know, I think it's this great cultural tradition that we have, not only for me to have the opportunity to share what I'm thinking and what's going on across the company, but also for me to be able to learn what you know, people are thinking right, and what, what I should be thinking about that I'm missing. So a few years ago, we started doing this with our community too. And we started doing town hall Q&As around the world. 
so I could learn not just from you know, people within our company, but also people in our community all around the world, what we should be thinking about and doing differently. So that's what I hope to do today. I'm looking forward to hearing your questions, uh, hearing your ideas, uh, sharing some of how we think about things, and hopefully taking some things back to Facebook in California that we can use to help serve the whole community all across the world better. So thank you guys so much for coming out here today. Uh, let's get started. Thank you very much, Mark. So the top question, as you were saying before, actually comes from the thread and is related to the earthquake. Uh, it comes from Marcello. Mark, are you coming to Italy? And I'm really happy for it. Uh, should be great if you could leave a sign here in my country to help the people of central Italy who lost everything yesterday night. Money, words, any possible way to help. Yeah, so... You know, when I first learned about the earthquake, you know, it just made me incredibly sad, right? And, you know, our first reaction is we have to do everything we can to help out. And, you know, since then we've been thinking about what are the ways that Facebook and our community can pull together to do uh, the most that we, that we can. Now, the biggest thing, and I think the most important, is this program that we run called Safety Check. And what it basically is, is it lets people, whenever there's a disaster, an earthquake, hurricane, uh, attack, <clears throat> tell their friends that they're safe. Right? And it notifies them, it sends a notification. And you know, I think that this is so important because when you're in a disaster, or when, when someone you love is in a disaster, you know, all you want to know is that they're safe, right? Now, the safety check that, that we ran in the last week, uh, because of the community here in Italy, uh, was one of the most effective that we've ever seen across the world. And what, what that means is that of the people who are in the, the region uh, that was affected by the earthquake, of the people who are on Facebook or use Facebook, almost half of them use safety check to mark themselves as safe, and that sent notifications reassuring their family that they were okay to more than 15 million people around the world. So that's a pretty important tool in times like this. But you know, we also wanted to do more. So we we started working with the Red Cross in Italy, and we gave them half a million euros uh, in ad credits and sat down with them to help them use the Facebook platform to help get whatever they needed from our community. Right? So whether that's uh, supplies, volunteers, uh, donations for blood, whatever they need. Right? Because what, what I think we all know is that you know, when, when a disaster like this happens, you know, there's a lot of media attention for a short period of time and you know, people talk about it, but then you know, the real pain and the real rebuilding happens over a long period of time. Right? So you want to empower good organizations like the Red Cross who can stay focused on this for much longer than the cameras are going to be uh, focusing on, wh on what's going on here. So that's what, what we're trying to, to do here. Um, you know, the third thing that I'm pretty proud of when I see is you know, people who are part of the community here in Italy uh, using the tools to, to rally right, and, and support the community overall. So one story that, that particularly touched me was there was a restaurant uh, that posted on their Facebook page that for every uh, dish of, I, I hope I don't mispronounce this, I'm a Trishiana. Um, how are we doing? All right, good, thank you. Um, that they serve, they're going to set aside one euro to go to the disaster relief effort. And they used Facebook to not only say that they were doing this, but encourage other restaurants around the country to participate as well. And so far, 700 different restaurants have signed up to do this pledge as well. And you know, that's just an awesome example of this community coming together to help you know, other people in, in Italy and all over the world, wherever you are. And you know, that's the kind of thing that I feel like we can uniquely do, and we have a responsibility to do, and we want to do to make sure that, that, that we can help the folks who are, who are here as much as possible. We... we will now take a question from the room. Let me look around. You're all very shy. You had a question, so don't forget to stand up, present yourself, and you can make your question. Hi, Mark. I'm Alessio. 
And we have all seen the incredible success of uh, Pokemon Go with its augmented reality. And how much do you think this is going to change our social life? And uh, if Facebook will manage to uh, change our life as much as Pokemon Go with its where, Oculus Rift? Thank you. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, I'm glad you asked that. Because, you know, the real reason I came to Rome was to, to find some, some rare Pokemon. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I went for a run this morning past the Colosseum, and people thought I was doing that because I want to be healthy. I, I was just trying to find this one rare Pokemon that I've heard hang out, hangs out there. No, but, but in all seriousness, um, you know, I think that virtual reality and augmented reality are going to be the most social platform that has ever existed. Right, and if you think about the history of computing, right, every 10 or 15 years, a big new computing platform comes along. Right? So we had desktop computers, and then you know, we had browsers and the internet, and now we have mobile phones. And you know, the, it's great, and each one's better than the one before it, but what we have now is not the end of the line. Right? We're gonna get to a point where in you know, five or 10 years, uh, we're all using virtual or augmented reality, um, probably more like 10 years than five for everyone to, to use it. And the thing that sets virtual reality apart is that you feel like you're really there, like you're, like you're present. And you know, if you think about it, you, you look at a, at a photo or a video on a screen or at a TV or a computer or a phone, and you're kind of trying to get your mindset in this uh, perspective of as if you're there, right? You're trying to pretend you see the photo um, of something and you're trying to kind of imagine what it's like to be there. But virtual reality is different because it actually, it kind of, it's programmed to work exactly the way that your brain does. So it, if anything, when you, when you look at it, you feel like you're in that place, like you're present. Uh, and if anything, you're, you're trying to convince yourself that you're not actually there because you know, as you look around, you're, you're seeing as if, um, as if it's the, the, the real world. So you, know, you can imagine in the future how you're gonna be able to feel like you're right there with another person who couldn't necessarily be with you in person. Right? So I think about my family right, when I'm not there. You know, I, I'm my daughter, right? I mean, she's, uh, she's in California right now, right? And I, I miss her. And I think to, to be able to feel like I'm right there with her would just be a really powerful social experience. I'm gonna wanna have. Um, now, in terms of augmented reality, right? So there's virtual reality where you feel completely immersed. And then there's augmented reality where you kind of are adding virtual elements onto the world. And what I think we're gonna see there is that that's gonna come to mobile phones first before we get some kind of smart glasses that overlay stuff in the world. So you're gonna see apps like Pokemon Go. Um, you're gonna see things like face filters like we have in our Masquerade app. We just launched this test for the Olympics in Brazil and Canada where people could support their country by uh, putting face paint on. We, we didn't launch it here in Italy because it was just a test to, to start, but we hope to uh, once we, we get that further along. And I, I think that there are gonna be a bunch of tools like that that kind of overlay real things from the world on top of your experience and help you share things that we're gonna see soon. Hey, Ma hey, Mark, we have a question from the back, huh? so here we are. Hi, my name is Martina, and I'm studying computer engineering. I would like to ask you, how important are uh, our origins, in your opinion? Those who live in Italy have more difficulty emerging than the Americans. What advice would you give you to Italians? Well, I think more than ever now, great ideas are coming from everywhere. Right, I mean, as the internet spreads, you know, it used to be that you were constrained to where you could build a business by where you were, uh, but now you can build something and serve people all around the world. Right, and I've had a couple of examples that I've seen of this uh, just on this trip so far. Right, so right before I came to Rome, I was, it was actually at the wedding of one of my close friends who is a great European entrepreneur, Daniel Ek. Um, he, he's the founder of Spotify. Not, not from Italy, but, but from Europe overall. And most of the people who he serves are not from his country, right? Another example, I think um, you know, one of our winners of our FB Start program that we do across the world to help uh, developers 
uh, build different tools and build businesses. Um, Max Chiochola, um, I, I heard might be here, is that right? There he is, you wanna stand up for a second? Uh, the founder of, of a company, Thanks for coming out. Um, I think you're doing great work. Uh, founder of the company Music's Match, uh, building crowdsourced lyrics for, uh, for songs. And you know, I think what we're seeing, though, is that more than ever now, uh, we have the ability to, wherever we come from, to put an idea online and see where it resonates. And you know, I think in Italy especially, what we see with the community here is that more people I use Facebook to actually connect with businesses, small and medium businesses, than almost any other country in the world. Of the, I think it's about 29 million people in Italy are on Facebook. So it's about 90% of people who are on the internet. Um, you know, nine in 10 of, of people in Italy are connected to a small and medium business, which is, is, is a standout for what we see across the world, which I think means that if you're interested in starting a business here in Italy, um, that's a pretty good entrepreneurial culture and community that you have here of people who want to engage. So, um, so I'd be optimistic and, and just focus on what you, wanna, what you wanna build and bring it to the world. So then we, we have other question from the room. So we have a question here. Hi, Mark, I'm Cristina. Uh, failure is mostly seen in Italy as something bad, but I know Facebook's culture is different. This is why I'd like to ask you, have you ever failed in your life, and what did you learn about failure? Thanks. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. You know, I think a lot of entrepreneurship is learning as quickly as you can. Right? Because no one starts off knowing everything that they're gonna need to build something. So the best thing that you can do is not, not study as much as you can before, or not pretend that you know everything. It's go into it with this mindset that your job is to learn as much as you can as quickly as you can. And you know, try to have this mindset that, you know, in the end, I don't think we're judged by our, our failures. I think we're judged by the change that we make in the world. And you know, when you fail, you just, you know, whatever that idea was, it just didn't reach whatever impact you were hoping for. You know, one of my favorite stories, I, I love reading about um, famous scientists. And you know, one of my favorite stories is this biography of Albert Einstein. And it talks about all these things that he just totally messed up, right? I mean, he's well known for the theory of relativity, which of course changed the world in so many ways, right? Changed fundamental physics, changed how we think about energy. Um, change how we think about the whole universe. But his belief in that also led him to make a lot of mistakes. Right? It led him to think that there couldn't possibly be black holes, because his belief that space-time was this beautiful thing led him to think that oh, black holes are a rip in space-time, that can't possibly be. So in some ways, you know, he was kind of against that, he was a little bit against quantum mechanics, and those theories have ended up being wrong of his. But in the end of the day, you know, no one really remembers that. Right, what people remember is the, the good stuff that he did and how he experimented along the way to learn and prove his theory of relativity, which ended up making such a big impact um, on, on the last century and going forward. And I think that the more that we can remember that and build that into our entrepreneurial culture, I think the more great ideas and, and people will, will succeed around the world. Because at the end of the day, it really isn't how you fail, it's what you take away from that and, and do going forward. Now we have a, another question from the thread. We also need to, to respond to the questions arriving from the thread. So uh, it is from Giacomo from Lewis University, so one of your colleagues. Uh, he would like to know something quite personal. So uh, what are the three top personal qualities to reach the top, in your opinion? Uh, um, so I think if you want to build something great, you should focus on what the changes that you want to make in the world. Where that to me is number one. Where I see too many entrepreneurs who decide that they want to start a company before they actually know what it is that they want to build. And to me that just seems backwards, right? You, you know, building a company is, you're gonna change a lot. You're gonna need to learn a lot along, along the way. So it really makes sense to go in with an idea of what 
uh, what the impact is that you're going to want to do, um, not, not that you want to you know, have a bunch of people working for you or, or want to start a company or something like that. The, the second is that no one does it alone, right? So you need to get the best, you need to build the best team that you can. But I think that there's this myth in the world that of, of kind of the founder, right, the, the individual. You know, a lot of people, they talk about me and Facebook. And it drives me a little crazy because I think that that understates that this is a big team effort, right? I mean, we have a, a lot of people working on Facebook now, thousands. Um, and even at the beginning, there were a, a bunch of people who were working on it. And when you look at most big things that get done in the world, they're not done by one person. So, you know, you're going to need to build a team. And so you go in with the idea of what you, what you want to do in the world. And, and the next most important thing that you're going to do is, is just surround yourself with the, the best people that you can to learn from. Because uh, you know, you're going to need to learn over time, and you're going to need people who have complementary skills, because you're not, uh, no matter how talented you are, you know, there are just going to be things that you don't bring to the table. I and mean, that's certainly true for me. Uh, we, our company works because we have a really talented core team of people who complement me, who have different skills that I don't, that I don't have. Uh, and then the third thing that I would say is just persistence. Right, so nothing ever goes the way you want it to. Right, people talk about overnight success, and it's, that's not the way it works. Right, overnight success happens after you work for a long period of time um, to, to build something, then one day you wake up and people are like, oh, this is successful, it just appeared. Um, and you know, that's never how you experience it when you're actually working on it. And so you know, all the, when you're building something, you're just going through all these trials and tribulations along the way, and you know, I think a lot of people give up, right? And that takes different forms, right? It's, you don't have the, you, you don't push through to see through what you believe. Um, some people um, sell their company before it reaches its full potential. Um, some people change the direction. Um, some people leave. But you know, I think that the biggest things that have gotten done in the world are, are, tend to be done by you know, people who primarily believe in a mission and are not trying to build a company, uh, first and foremost. By, by teams, not by individuals, and by people who just don't give up. So, Mark, now we have, uh, we have a question from a video from Pesaro. Salve, mi chiamo Filippo, vengo da Pesaro, e la mia domanda è, quali sono stati i punti di forza per cui Facebook è riuscita a superare in altri social network? Uh, so you got to translate that for me. <laughs> so the, the, the question basically is, uh, uh, which are the main strengths that made uh, uh, Facebook so successful? Hmm. <laughs> I think it's that we focus on learning, right? It's, I mean, the last question was a little bit similar in that, you know, I think in order to build an organization, you want to build an organization that's focused on on mission and your purpose above all, that has a strong team and that is, is very focused um, and, and doesn't give up when, when things get tough. But you know, I, I think more than anything, um, you also need to build an organization that, that is focused on learning. Right? And you know, great ideas come from everywhere. Right? They come from listening to our community. Uh, they, they come from our employees. They come from doing research. Uh, they, they come from other companies who are doing interesting things in this space. And, and our job is to just learn as much as we can uh, to build the best things that we can for, for our community. Right? So uh, I can give you one of my favorite examples about this. It, it, I, I think it, when you're building a company, you want to set yourself up to just learn as, as quickly as you can. And for us, one of the ways that we do that is by empowering all these different people at Facebook. We have thousands and thousands of engineers. And you know, if every idea had to go through me, and then the company would probably go pretty slowly, right? If, if everyone had to run by, by, by me what they wanted to do. So instead, what we've done is we've built this whole system where any engineer can just experiment with, um, with their own idea. Right? So you can, you can build something, you can try something out, and you can, you can release it to the world. Not to the whole community, right? So not to uh, more than a billion people, but you can roll it out to maybe 10,000 people or 100,000 people, or right? a, a lot of people in the community to see how they like it. And you get feedback, right? So every, every engineer does this, and they, they get feedback on you know, how 
their idea and their version of Facebook that they have built um, helps people share? Does it help people more than, than the other versions or less? Um, how connected do people feel? How happy do they feel? Um, you know, how informed do they feel by the news and their news feed? Um, how much do they enjoy the ads or the businesses that they interact with? And it, when someone ships an idea that's good, then we incorporate that into the version of Facebook that we ship for all billion people around the world. And if it's not a good idea, then we catalog it and we, we write down what the idea was, so that way we don't keep on repeating it. Um, but we learn that lesson and then we go on and do different stuff. But a lot of what we're trying to do is empower the organization to learn as many lessons as it can as quickly as possible. And you know, if someone tests something and it doesn't work, then that's not the end of the world. We just go on to the next idea and keep learning. But I think that that's how, over the last 12 years, we've been able to stay ahead and keep building things at a faster rate than all the other competitors and other folks in the space, is that we just are really focused on learning as quickly as we can. Because we know that we don't have all the ideas today, and uh, that you know, building a company over the long term is about having a lot of ideas. It's not just one at the beginning. So that's what we need to do. So now we're going to take another question from the room. And I know there was one here. Don't forget to present yourself. Hi, uh, I'm Alessandro. And uh, I have a question about your plane, Aquila. How did you get uh, this idea? And uh, how do you think it's going to influence the future of um, undeveloped countries like Africa, where uh, people still don't have access to the internet? Yeah. So if you want to connect everyone in the world, Helping everyone get on the internet is really important, <laughs> right? And you know, it turns out today, you know, even though you know, we all have phones, right, and, and, and use the internet, that more than half of people in the world today are not on the internet. So that is just a really important problem that we want to help solve for the world in the next 10 or 15 years. And it, it turns out that the internet is really important for a lot of people beyond just uh, staying connected and beyond knowing what's going on with your friends and family, you, the internet also helps deliver uh, really important tools like education. Right? If you live in a place where there's not a good school, then the internet's one of your best bets for getting education information. But if you live in a place and you don't have access to a good doctor, and you, know, you want to know if your, your child is sick or something like that, then the internet is one of your best tools to be able to do that. So there's a lot of research that shows that for every 10 people who get on the internet, about one person gets lifted out of poverty and new jobs get created. So you know, for you know, three or four billion people around the world who are not on the internet, one of the best things that we can do is help connect everyone around the world. And it turns out that there are a few big issues uh, that are blocking people from using the internet. So the first is, um, is kind of the infrastructure. Right? There are a lot of people who, you know, even if you had a phone, you, there, there would be no network around where you are. Right? And that's the problem that Aquila is trying to solve. Right? If you live in some remote area, then what we're going to do is we, we've designed this plane that can fly uh, over your village or, or your, your town and can stay there for three or six months at a time. And it's almost like a cell phone tower in the sky. And it beams down internet access to people so that way they can have access to the internet no matter where they are. Um, there are other problems, too. Right, so another problem is, is cost. Right? So it's not just some people have access. There is an internet where they live, um, but they can't afford to use it. So for that, you know, we need to do a number of things. We need to make it so that we, we make the cost of using the internet cheaper. And we can do that both by making data rates less expensive. Uh, we have programs to do that. And by making it so that our apps use less data. Right? So that's, um, that's a big effort that we have. And in the last few years, we've actually made it so that our Facebook app uses one-tenth as much data as it did before. So if you're paying per bit uh, to, to use the internet, then now using Facebook costs only 10% of what it did before. So there, there's a lot more uh, that we can do and empower other developers to do. And the third category that I think is important to talk about, too, is that there are a lot of people who, um, who actually can't afford to use the internet. And there is a network, but you know, they didn't grow up with the internet. Right? Maybe they didn't have a computer, or um, they just never used the internet. So if you go up to them and you ask, uh, do you do you want to pay for a data plan? Uh, their first question is, you know, wh why would I want to pay for a data plan? So we need to show why the internet is valuable. And that's why we have this program, Free Basics, uh, which goes and, and gives people some free services on the internet uh, for free, which then, after people experience the internet, they end up 
realizing why it's so valuable to connect and, um, and, and connecting more broadly. So, you know, the, the internet connectivity efforts that we've done at Facebook so far have already connected uh, more than 25 million people around the world. It's a, it's a small impact uh, against the, the billions of people who don't have access and need it, but we're ramping up, it's growing quickly, and uh, I think efforts like Aquila um, are, are going to help a lot on this too. So, Mark? Mark, we have another question from the back. Yeah. All right. Hi, Mark. I'm Daniele. You talked about the safety check earlier, and I'd like to ask you, is it going to change in the future? Um, will users be able to activate it on their own, perhaps to alert other people? How is it going to change? Thank you. Yes, it is. We're working on that already. You know, and it's not... So the, the way that we think about this for, for the product is that you know, there are certain moments of truth, is, is what we call them internally, right? which are, are basically, right, it, if you're a social product about building community and relationships, then when there's a crisis, whether it's you know, a, a natural disaster or an attack, um, you know, or you know, a child goes missing, um, or you know, a friend is sick, you know, the most important thing that I think we can do is, is help make sure that people are safe and protected, right? And, you know, so if, if what you're building is a community product, um, you know, I think that this is one of the moments of truth for us, right? It's, it's how we judge whether Facebook is successful at what we're supposed to be doing is not just on, you know, whether you can share the photo of your fun moment, you know, your fun night out with your friends or your cute photo of your child, um, but it's also, it's whether, pe whether our community is strong enough and we give people the tools to keep people safe in, in those situations. So, you know, we're, we're working on what you say, right? Because when Safety Check got started a couple of years ago, it was only for natural disasters, right? Earthquakes and hurricanes. Um, unfortunately, since then, we, we've had to expand it to deal with terrorist attacks too, right? Because that's just been, um, uh, unfortunately, too common, right, over, over the last few years. And the next thing that we need to do is make it so that communities can trigger it themselves when there's some disaster. But there are other things like this too that, that I want to see us do, right? So it's not just that, it's you know, Amber Alerts, right? This program that we have in the US and Canada and a number of countries, if a child goes missing, um, we want to make sure that our community can help uh, find that child, and we have in a number of cases, right? It's, it's suicide prevention, right? If, if someone uh, posts that, that they're you know, thinking of, of, of killing themselves, and you know, someone sees that, then we want to make sure that we empower our community to help their friend or their loved one reach the right resources um, at the right time, right? And that's a matter of life and death. And you know, we're really proud of the impact that we've been able to have there in, in the early places where we've rolled that out. And then you know, there are things like giving people the ability to organize, to donate blood, and come together in different ways that, uh, that we want to make sure that we push as well. But for us, this is so core to the mission and we judge ourselves by how well Facebook and our community perform in these moments of truth. And um, so you bet that we're gonna wanna work on this for the future. So Mark, we have now uh, another question coming from video. Uh, Tio Kim from Canada. Hi Mark, my name is Taehu and I'm a second year medical student in Canada, originally from South Korea. Today, I'd like to ask you how you motivate yourself at work to stay on track. I'd like to be able to use my training four hours more efficiently. Thank you. Bye. I don't know. Hmm. You know, I don't actually, I mean, I, I think I could do a lot better at that. So. I'm not sure I have the answer to that. Although, you know, I think that's the answer. Um, so, <laughs> you know, I always think that there's more that we can do. And I've, I've never thought about it in, this, in these terms before, but this is something that my, my family has really taught me. Um, and I think about it, it's something that my parents taught me, but I, I think it actually goes back even further than that. I mean, it's. Um, you know, in the United States, you know, people come as immigrants, right? And, uh, you know, it's people who come because they have hope that they want to make their, their life better and for their children. And they come and they work hard. And, 
my grandparents you know, grew up and went through this economic depression and sold whatever they could on the street, right, to make sure that my, my parents could grow up and have a good life. And they, they taught them that you had to work hard and that they passed along this hope uh, that you could just kind of always do better and that you could always use your time better and, and have a bigger impact on the world. And my, my parents took that. And then they studied really hard, right, because my, my, my grandparents kind of made them. They pushed them. That was the big push. And um, they wanted to do more. And my parents both became doctors. And, and they, taught, they taught me this, and, and my, my sisters, that you know, we had a responsibility to do everything we can with, with our time here on, on this earth to, uh, to just have the biggest impact that we can. I remember re really vividly when I was growing up, my mom sat me down uh, one day at lunch and said, you know, your father and I are both doctors, and we're you know, happy with the impact that we're able to have, but you have a responsibility to help even more people, right? Because you, you have, you're growing up with the ability to learn how to do more things, and I don't know. I mean, I, I just think, you know, especially for, for where, where I am and, you know, what, what Facebook is at this point, I, I just, I, I wake up every day and I feel this deep responsibility to, we don't have that many days here, right? And you know, I feel like we have to make the biggest impact that we can, both at, at Facebook and, and in our philanthropy. And you know, it's taken on new meaning for me in the last year because you know, now I have a daughter. And you know, I, I feel like in this uh, family progression, I want to make sure that I can pass along that hope and that ethic to her and do my part in making sure that she and everyone in her generation can have a better life as well, but I don't know, I've never thought about it like that before. Yeah. So we have a question from the live thread, so from people following us uh, live, and it comes from Parta Hegde. It's a very personal question. How is Max? She's good. I miss her. This is the, I think this is the longest I'll have been apart from her, and I mean, I, like I wake up in the morning and she sees me and she starts crawling towards me. And it's, I mean, it's like the happiest thing. I mean, nothing has made me happier in my life than you see your daughter, and she can't walk yet, uh, soon, maybe, and, uh, but, just seeing the, the joy on her face, and it's like she's doing what she can to get to, get to me. Um, I don't know, there's nothing like that, right? But she's awesome, she's doing well. I, I'm, I'm very proud of her. That is great. <laughs> we have a video now, another video from Davide from Napoli. Hi. My name is Davide Cucurullo and I'm from Naples. I have a question about the role of Facebook in the media. Do you see it as an editor? Thank you very much. Uh, no. <laughs> you know, we're a technology company, but we're not a media company. Right, so when you think about a media company, it's, you know, you have people who are producing content, who are editing content, and, you know, that's not us. We're, we're a technology company. We build tools. We do not produce any of the content. We exist to give you the tools to curate and have the experience that you want to connect with the people and businesses and institutions in the world that you want, right? So every person gets to program their own Facebook experience, right? You choose who your friends are, who you want to follow. Um, you know, what businesses you want to follow, um, and what other institutions, and in that way, you know, one of the cool things I think about social media is that I think it's the most diverse form of media that has ever existed. Right? I mean, if you think about the way that media worked, you know, in the last generation and, and before the internet, you know, we had TV, right, we had newspapers, but there usually weren't that many TV stations or newspapers that had the kind of news that you would want to watch, right? So maybe there were three or four stations, right? And they all kind of covered the same thing, right? 
maybe a, a, one different editorial slant on it. Um, same thing with newspapers, right? There were probably a few in any given area, and they had different editorial views. You kind of picked the one that you wanted to, to read, and you got all of your information from that. But now think about the internet, and think about social media, and think about your feed. Right? I mean, you now have the chance to connect with people all over, all over the world, right? One stat that I love is the average person in Europe uh, who uses Facebook has, I think it's more than 50 friends from outside their country, right? So now you're, you're not just getting your news from around you, um, but you are connected to and, and, and getting updates from people all around the world, right? All around the continent and all around other places. And, you know, most people, you know, a lot of your friends might share your views, but most people have some friends who don't, right? Who come from different backgrounds, um, who are different ethnic backgrounds, different ideas, different political philosophies, and you're going to see their content too, which is very different from what you'd see in a newspaper or TV station where you just kind of get all your news from one place. So, you know, I think that we're really proud of our role as a technology company and not a media company in this. I think the world needs this. The world needs media companies too, but I think the world also needs technology platforms uh, like what we do, and we, we take our role in this very seriously. Another, another question from the back. Uh, here we are. Hi, Mark. It's Alessio. Have you ever thought that Facebook has changed and maybe ruined how people communicate each other? I mean, I'm a frequent user. I'm not saying anything bad, but it's true that in the past, people used to communicate with real smile, face to face, more often than now. So, isn't it? <laughs> you know, no. If, if I thought that we ruined communication, I'd just change our product. <laughs> I mean, think about it. If you were working on something and you thought you broke something that was really important in the world, wouldn't you just change what you were doing? I, I would hope so. Getting some blank faces. Um, <laughs> when you start businesses, I, I hope the answer to that is yes. Um, uh, here's how I think about this. You know, Facebook doesn't, people don't mostly use it for communicating, it, for replacing the face-to-face -face interactions that they have. It's for making it so that you can communicate with people who you wouldn't otherwise have the opportunity to connect with. Right, so when I'm hanging out with my family or with my wife, I don't <laughs> go to the other room and then talk to her on Facebook, right? I mean, that's not, that, that would not be good, right? I mean, it, nothing replaces face-to-face -face interaction. Um, although in the future, hopefully virtual reality will help get close for when you're not there. But what, what it does is it gives you the ability to stay in touch with people who you wouldn't have the ability to do that with otherwise. Right, so my sister lives on the other side of the country from me, and I wanna know what's going on with her kids. Right, so I can see her updates on Facebook, right? And she can send me messages on Facebook Messenger and, and WhatsApp throughout the day keeping me posted. And if she didn't have those tools, then you know, I'd have to wait until she traveled out to California or I traveled out to New York or, um, or I got on the phone with her, um, which you know, unfortunately just happened more rarely than I'd like. And I think we can all kind of relate to this. There are probably people in your life who you just, you wouldn't be in touch with if you didn't have those updates in the background. Maybe you're not close with them enough to go visit them or to call them, but you like seeing what they're up to from time to time. And, you know, that's what Facebook does. And I definitely don't think that that's ruining anything. I think that that's augmenting what we already do. Right? We, all, we have the tools to stay connected with the people who are right around us who we love the most, and now we also have technology that helps us stay connected with people that we love and care about no matter where they are. So, Mark, we have another question from the thread from Alessandro from Milan. He asks, uh, where did you study Latin? Why did you decide to study it? And he also comments on the fact that it's not common for Americans to study Latin or Greek. So what do you say to that, Mark? Well, so I started studying when I was in high school. And, and I have to be honest here, I'm not very good at languages. I actually started initially studying Latin because when I was in middle school, they offered Spanish and French, and I was terrible at both of them. And um, I, I love languages, I'm just really bad at them. Um, I've actually studied seven different languages in my life, uh, if, you, if you count English. And, you know, but the, the part that's really hard for me is speaking. So 
Latin, you don't have to speak. <laughs> it's, so that's how I, I got into it originally. And then, then I just kind of fell in love with it. I'm like, all right, this is awesome. I love the culture. I love the history. I, I love learning about stuff. Um, you know, I was, I was thinking about this on, on the way over. I'm like, all right, got to got to be able to relate. There's so many good uh, classical Roman entrepreneurship stories. Uh, I got to be able to drop one at this, at this town hall Q&A, um, or else what would, you know, what would this be? What would this whole trip to Rome be if I couldn't um, talk about Latin in some way? So, um, so uh, I'm going I'm to go pretty basic on this. How many of you guys have, have studied or read the Aeneid? OK. Wow. Um, how many of you guys study Latin? All right, there you go. All right, that good. And you know, there are a lot of people on, who are watching this live who, um, who who have not studied Latin or read the Aeneid, and who I think will appreciate this bit of Roman culture. Um, so, you know, one of my favorite stories that I think of is like the ultimate entrepreneurship story is is the Aeneid, right? Because basically, you have you know Aeneas and his family and his crew. Um, they're they're leaving Troy, right? The the Greeks have just burnt down their beloved city, and they're looking to find the, the next place where they're going to live and, and found a new, a new place. And they leave, and you know, unbeknownst to Aeneas, he has uh, really angered the gods. So Im immediately upon, upon leaving, um, you know, there's this huge storm in the water, and you know, the vast majority of their ships are just immediately destroyed. So not only does the, has their city just been burnt to the ground, but, but now most of the crew um, who, who made it out and fled the city um, did not make it through just the first part of the voyage, too. And there's this very famous uh, line, which is probably my favorite line of all, all Latin. Um, I think it's line 202 of the first book, um, although I may be wrong. Forson et haec olum meminissa uabit. And he says, as he is kind of on this, this, um, these rocks uh, being beached, um, that you know, this, is, this is a terrible situation, but perhaps one day uh, we will even look back on this fondly. And uh, of course, he goes on to found, um, to later, his, his, um, his progeny goes on to found Rome, right? Um, you know, one of the greatest cultures and, and, and cities in the, the history of the world. And you know, I kind of think about this. This is like the perfect entrepreneurship story, right? I mean, he, the guy has a clear mission, right? I mean, he's, he's not out for himself. He is out there to, to serve um, his people and his community and build something much greater than himself. He wants to found a new city uh, for his people in a great city. Um, and he's not doing it alone, right? I mean, he has this whole team of, of people and you know, the fierce spirit uh, of the Trojans. And, and of course, it doesn't help to have some gods on your side, which I think is probably true in entrepreneurship and building a business, too. Uh, and, but more than anything, he doesn't give up. And he just kind of keeps on pushing and pushing, and he succeeds. And now we all have this beautiful, amazing city, um, at least because of the myth right? that, 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 that was him um, and, and his crew. And I just think that's kind of the perfect entrepreneurship story of mission, team, perseverance, everything that you need to do to build something great and lasting in the world in one of the most beautiful, classic um, Roman and, and Latin pieces of, of art. And, you know, I know we're, we're here to talk about technology and not Latin, but you got to humor me, because I, I love this stuff. <laughs> There's no way I'm going to come to Rome and not tell a Latin story. So looking for a question. <clears throat> Hi, Mark. My name is Chiara, and I'm a marketing student. Facebook has entered in our life and has completely changed the dynamics of economic markets worldwide. For this reason, I ask you, what advice would you give to all young people who deeply love what they do and would um, have an important role in the future in this area. Thank you. Uh, 
the most important thing that I, that I think I can say is that you have the tools to build what you want. Right, I, I remember when I was studying computer science in college for that short period of time that, you know, I remember thinking, okay, I'm taking these classes, but one day somewhere out there, there are people who do this for real, right? I'm just, I'm just learning these classes, um, but there's real programming. I remember actually really specifically the night that I released the first version of Facebook, thinking that some other real company out there was going to build this for the world because there was no way that a bunch of college students um, who didn't know anything about business were going to uh, be able to build something like this better than big companies that had thousands of engineers and were already serving hundreds of millions of people and had millions of servers and, and all that. Um, but it turned out that we, we actually kind of knew what we needed to, right? And there's, there's some media myths about entrepreneurship that I think are actually pretty disempowering, right? The idea that you have to do everything yourself, right? That there's kind of the founder myth that, that we talked about before. Um, you know, I think it's really disempowering because it makes you feel like if you can't do everything yourself, then maybe you can't build something. But I think that that is, it's kind of, it's wrong, right? I mean, nothing great has ever been built by just one person. Um, similarly, I think the, uh, there is a lot of mythology that great ideas or, or things that are big come fully formed as an idea. And you, if you don't kind of have your big thing that you want to go do, then you, know, you should go home because you, know, you, you can't compare to the other people who do. But you know, that's not how anything works in the world. Right? Nothing ever comes out fully formed. Right? People start because they, they have something that they care about and you work on it and you care about it. And a lot of the time, I think it's just because you care more that you end up su succeeding and pushing hard. And that's definitely the, the story of Facebook, where there was no reason why those other companies couldn't have built what we built. Um, we were college students who had many fewer resources. We built it because we just cared more when they didn't. And I, I think the same is going to be true for you and a lot of other folks as well. And you know, so if you just believe, um, w which I think is true, that you already know what you need to and you have the tools um, to go into this and at least get started. When you're going to learn a ton along the way, but you know what you need to to get started, then, um, then you can go for it. There was one question here. Please, Alzati. Um, it's Roberto, student in Lewis, uh, founder of BuzzRapido.com. Uh, I would like to ask, um, at what stage are you uh, with the development of your personal Jarvis? And when can we buy one? Oh, you know, I'm making progress. And I hope to have a demo hopefully next month. And, you know, so for one of my personal, every year I do these personal challenges, right? So one year was study Mandarin recently, which was especially hard because I'm bad at languages. This year, it's, I have two. Uh, one, one of the challenges was to build an AI system to help me control my home and do my work. And then the other was to, run an average of one mile a day. So it turns out that one of those challenges is a lot easier than the other. Um, so the, the running, I finished about halfway through the year. The AI, still working on. But you know, I got it to this point where now it can, I can control the lights, I can control the gates, I can control the, the temperature, uh, much to uh, the chagrin of my wife, who now cannot control the temperature um, because it is programmed to only listen to my voice, um, which is, one of the perks of being an engineer is you, you can do that. I'll, I'll give her access once I'm done. Um, so it's, it's getting there. And it's starting to be able to do some pretty fun things. And I'm looking forward to being able to show it to the world. I'm, I'm really proud not only of you know, just this quick demo that I've been able to build, but it's awesome because I get to interact with all these Facebook engineers who are doing all this awesome AI work right? in, um, in speech recognition, um, and face recognition. I, I programmed it so now when I walk up to my, my door, uh, my gate, I, I don't have to put in a code or something like that to get in um, or put in a key. It just sees my face and it lets me in. And um, so that, that, that is pretty fun. But it's, there's some state-of-the-art AI in there that it's been awesome to get a chance to work with our engineers at Facebook and really see on a day-to-day -day basis what they're doing and how far advanced the work is that they're doing. It's been a really cool experience so far, and I'm looking forward to showing it off next month. So, Marca, we have a, we have a question from live from James de Paula Marca from Brazil. 
And uh, the question is, uh, what's the future, future of education and how internet can improve it? So one thing that, that we're really focused on is personalized learning. Right? It's this idea that students learn better when they're not just in a class with a teacher lecturing to everyone at the same pace, but when people have the opportunity to learn at the pace that they, that they want to go. Right? So if there's you know, some subject that you, you get really quickly, then you can just go really far in that really quickly. And if there's you know, something that, you know, let's say you're not as good at math, you can take as long as you need on each of the lessons on that. So that, I think, is really important. And then the other aspect of personalized learning is giving people the tools to learn in the way that, that fits them. Right? So some people will learn best by partnering and working with other students or by uh, listening to a teacher or talking to a teacher. Some people work best by playing games. Right? Some people work best by uh, watching videos or doing practice problems. And what we want to do is enable all students across the world to have the tools that they need to learn in the way that suits them, at the pace that suits them. Um, and, and that's something that I think the internet can really help with. Right? It can help give teachers the tools that they need to teach their students in this kind of a personalized way. So this is something that we're working on both at Facebook uh, by building software for personalized learning. And we're, we're really happy. We now have this in more than 100 schools, um, starting in the US, but hope to have this all around the world uh, pretty soon. And it's a big focus for us on our philanthropy as well. The Chen Zuckerberg uh, Initiative, um, our, our, our big effort to help improve education, um, among other things around the world, is also funding a lot of different personalized learning models um, to help spread this kind of model. But you know, I, I think I'm really optimistic about personalized learning. The results that we get from the initial schools who are doing it are really good. It shows that you know, students who are at the top of their class can get really far ahead just by learning as quickly as they can. Students who might be falling behind now don't need to fall behind because they can just take as long as they need to on the lessons. The results are really good, and I'm really excited to get this into to more teachers' hands and more students' hands around the world. You had, and this is actually the last question, guys. I'm sorry. You had a question. We're having so much fun. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, Mark. I am Maria Sole. And I'd like to ask you, how did you manage to keep your composure when you became so famous as you are? Thank you. Oh. <laughs> you know, some things change, but most don't. Right? You know, I'm still working with a lot of the same people that I have been working with you know, from really early on. It's, it's one of the things that has been the most important to me is, you know, you have family. Um, you know, my wife, we've actually known each other since before I started Facebook. Uh, my, my core team at Facebook, you know, I think of you know, folks like Cheryl. You know, we've been working together for around eight years now. Um, Chris Cox, the person who runs our, our product uh, team, been working with him for 10 years, right? Our chief technology officer has been at the company for almost 10 years. And you know, one thing that I think you find is that you build these partnerships and they just keep on getting better and better and better over time, right? On the personal side and on, and on the work side. And you learn more and you, you grow together and, you know, and it keeps you grounded and focused on what really matters, which at the end of the day is helping people connect with the people they care about. Um, and reaching people no matter where they are, and uh, you know, just coming in every day and trying to do the best that we can for people all around the world. But um, I don't know, those relationships, I think, are really the key. All right. Thank you. I really appreciate you guys coming out. I, I, love, I love being here in Rome with you. You can hopefully tell from my stories how.